ATAC students, this is your teacher Roy again with a review of Accounting 134. Accounting 134 is the prerequisite class you probably took last semester, the prerequisite for our class, Accounting 137. In Accounting 134, you learned individual income taxation preparation. And we're going to continue working with individuals here in Accounting 137. But what we're going to do is learn business income that's reported on that Form 1040 that you've already prepared last semester. Now we're going to just add a few more schedules or forms to that 1040 form for the business income that we're learning now. Later this semester, we're going to find out that businesses can be run through partnerships and partnerships have to file a form called 1065. Partnerships don't pay income taxes generally, but it's the partners, possibly the individuals, that would have to report their share of the partnership income on their 1040 form. And the last chapter of the semester, we're going to prepare returns for corporations, which may pay income taxes and it would be filed with Form 1120. We'll also find out in that last chapter 11 of the semester, there's a type of corporation called S Corporation. And just like partnerships, the shareholders of S Corporations would have to report their share of the corporate income on their individual return. Whereas if it's a regular type corporation, sometimes we call that a C corporation, you learn back in Accounting 134, the corporation would pay dividends. And dividend income is now reported on the individual's return, but subject to lower tax rates. There are other types of taxpayers or other types of taxable entities called trust and estates or even non-profit organizations. All of these entities also have to file tax returns. In the case of trusts and estates, they would file Form 1041, or non-profit organizations Form 990. So for these types of entities, there are advanced topics probably covered in an upper division or graduate tax class that we're not gonna see this semester. So here is a review from chapter one of the tax formula. Basically, it's the tax form kind of compressed into one list of numbers. So the first number up here would be the total of all the taxable types of income that you had learned last semester and continuing in this semester. In last semester, you would learn different types of income in chapter two like wages, interest, dividends, retirement incomes, possibly Social Security, tax refunds. But now here in Accounting 137, this semester, we're going to include business income, maybe partners, partner share of partnership income here in gross income. Then we would subtract out deductions, some classified as four, AGI, Adjusted Gross Income. So you learned this in, uh, I believe, Chapter 5 of last semester. Uh, we're going to continue learning some of these deductions in our um, first chapter, probably in a, a week or so, in Accounting 137. More of these adjustments. To arrive at a number called adjusted gross income, which is very important because this number is used to calculate amounts for other income up here or other deductions over here or here, okay, and maybe even over here. Also, we're going to subtract out the most common one is standard deductions that you learned in Chapter 1 based upon the taxpayer's filing status, possibly age or disability, and itemized deductions, or itemized, yeah, not both, one of the, or the other, yeah, that we had learned, I believe, last semester in chapter, again, number five. And qualified business income deductions is also subtracted, 
And you've seen that possibly a little bit last semester, but we'll continue learning about this deduction here in Accounting 137 this semester. And to get the remainder of taxable income. And in Chapter 1, we learned that taxable income is then looked up on the tax tables if the taxable income is less than 100000 or if the taxable income is greater than or equal to 100000 we would use the tax rate schedules to get the tax for the whole year called the tax liability. Then we subtract out tax credits. Tax credits is something learned in Chapter 7 from last semester. And we'll maybe see a little bit new ones this semester for businesses. And also amounts you've already paid like withholdings or estimated tax payments. To get to the bottom line, either you have an overpayment that's refunded or maybe credited to next year's prepayments or a balance due, a tax due that you have to come up with when you file the tax return. Now, all of these amounts are, again, um, grouped together on the actual 1040 form. So let's take a look at that 1040 form. This is for 2018, and the 2019 return has a little bit more detail. Still not two full sides of one paper yet, but uh, it's uh, probably easier to work with than this 2018 form. Note that the first thing you fill in here at the top is the taxpayer's filing status. So one of the homework problems um, assigned for this first week is going to ask you to identify the filing status for certain situations. The filing status is important because it helps you figure out back here the taxpayer's maybe standard deduction. Also, the tax rates that are built into the tax table or listed on the tax rate schedule are based upon the uh, filing status of the taxpayer. So that's important to determine one of these five filing statuses for our taxpayer. Then you have the taxpayer's name, social security number, and if it's a joint return for the spouse. In the case of the standard deduction, there may be some um, uh, additional adjustments to the regular amount if the taxpayer can be claimed as a dependent or if the taxpayer has uh, age 65 or older, or if the taxpayer is disabled or blind. Um, here's the address you would use for corresponding with the IRS. And if you don't have your refund direct deposited into your bank account, this is the address the refund check will be mailed to. Something different that you won't see on the 2019 return that you do see here on 2018 is this question regarding whether the taxpayer and, and the other people listed on the return are covered with health insurance coverage for the whole year. If you weren't able to check off this box here, in 2018, you may have been subject to something called the shared responsibility payment. That's just a penalty if you're not covered with health insurance. That penalty disappears. This question disappears for 2019 and forward. If you have dependents, you have to identify them here and then check off whether they qualify you for that $2,000 child tax credit. Otherwise, they may help you with a $500 other uh, dependent credit. The taxpayer would sign off and date. Make sure you fill in the taxpayer's occupation. That kind of helps you identify maybe the types of income or deductions that may have to be claimed on a return. If a taxpayer has problems with uh, ID theft, they should be receiving every year an ID PIN number mailed to them, mailed to their their um, their address, you know, their, their home address. Um, and that number changes every year, yeah? So if you don't put in that number, um, the IRS will have a harder time processing the return. Okay, so most times uh, returns are now filed electronically, but if you do have taxpayers still uh, mailing in the return, they got to sign and mail it to the correct address as uh, listed in the instructions to the 1040 form. Professional preparers have to fill in this bottom section down here. 
We're going to assume whenever you do a homework assignment, though, for this semester, you don't need to fill this in. Uh, for example, if you prepare a return for family members or friends without being paid, yeah, you would just leave all of this blank here. Let's take a look at the back side. So, again, we learned some basic uh, income that's reported here. And if it's not listed on this lines 1 through 5, then it may have to be reported on a Schedule 1. And we're going to see the Schedule 1 this semester for our business income. And listed here and added into the total. You also have deductions, possibly, subtracted that are listed on that Schedule 1 to arrive at adjusted gross income. Okay, and again, you may have learned that last semester in Accounting 134. Here's where we subtract out the standard deduction or itemized deduction, just like we saw in that tax formula and QBI, or sometimes they call this Section 199A, Cap A deduction. Again, we'll talk about that later this semester. To arrive at taxable income that you look up on the tax table or ta use the tax rate schedule to get the regular income tax. And here we subtract out those credits. Um, we may have some other taxes, including this semester, the self-employment tax we'll see. Probably it is listed under this other taxes. To get the total tax for the year, and we subtract out the taxes already paid through withholding. We're also going to see possibly taxes we've paid through uh, estimated um, tax, quarterly tax payments that's reported on this schedule here, at least for 2018. To either get an overpayment that we want to probably have refunded to us, maybe faster by filling in this direct deposit information, Otherwise, again, the refund will be mailed to that address we have on the front of the 1040 form. Or if we have a balance due, you can also pay that electronically by setting up an account with the IRS online or mailing in a check with this paper form. Uh, and the amount would be over here, the amount you have due. Uh, let's talk about itemized deductions. So if you do have itemized deductions, you know you have to... Oh, here's the... 2019 form. It's um, not too much changes, but probably better. It's listing out more amounts right here on the 1040 form versus having go to, going to um, some schedules. Yeah. So here's the back side of the 1040 form. And it ain't no postcard size anymore. I wish they would even put more uh, lines here on this uh, 1040 form, it would make it easier. And then we would have to have less attached forms and schedules to the 1040. But let's talk about itemized deductions that are reported on a Schedule A. More and more people are claiming standard deduction uh, in the current years because the standard deductions have basically doubled in amount from 2018. So itemized deductions, on, at least on the federal, are being used less. Um, I've read somewhere roughly 90% of taxpayers filing returns are using standard deductions. The thing is, Hawaii, at least some states, have not changed their rules for itemized deductions. So you may claim the standard on the federal, but because the standard deduction is so small on the state, especially Hawaii, you're probably going to itemize on the Hawaii return. So you still may need to prepare this federal Schedule A to help you um, calculate the itemized deductions on the Hawaii return. Let's kind of zoom in here on our Schedule A. So you can see the different categories uh, off to the uh, left-hand side of the schedule. So the first category was medical. And for most people, they don't uh, report anything over here. So in line one, you would have to uh, report the qualifying medical costs for the year after in health insurance has paid their share. And then what you got to do is reduce that amount in line one by 7.5% of your adjusted gross income that you report back on the 1040 form. This 7.5% is 
is increasing to 10% for 2019 and future years. So because this reduction here is so big compared to this amount after insurance now, line four is probably zero, okay? Zero. Not used that often unless you have some kind of major uh, surgery. Line, uh, next section is state taxes that you can deduct. And of course, the big one would be income taxes that you've paid, including what was withheld from your pay during the year. And also real estate taxes you pay. But for 2018 and subsequent years, there's a dollar limit of now 10000 So for many moderate taxpayers and wealthy taxpayers, they're going to hit this $10,000 limit very easily. So no matter how big of amounts you have listed here, what you'll see here in line seven is a maximum of, uh, of, of 10,000. In the next section, for interest, basically mortgage interest, um, there was limits based upon the loan amount. In past years, it was, uh, I believe, 1 million or 1.1, roughly 1.1 million of loan interest on that loan amount. Again, this is not the interest, but the loan amount. And what you're deducting is the interest on that loan. For 2019, that limit went down to uh, new loans now. Yeah? Old loans are grandfathered in at the 1.1 million. New loans are limited in deductibility of uh, a balance of uh, 750,000. So for people who have big mortgages, possibly there's gonna be less being deducted over here based upon this loan limit, at least for 2018 and future years. The next category would be charitable contributions, and it's divided up into two parts, either money being contributed or non-monetary contributions. So you got make you got to make sure you have receipts. They call it acknowledgments and some documentation, especially if you're contributing non uh, monetary uh, uh, charitable contributions. Casualty and theft losses have been very limited. Right now, they're only deductible by individuals if it's for a federally declared disaster. So for here in Hawaii, we're looking at stuff like hurricane losses or tsunami or even uh, uh, lava flow damages. And you will have to fill out this form here. Otherwise, uh, smaller stuff like car accidents, even though it could be thousands of dollars losses, you cannot claim that anymore because it's not a federally declared disaster. So at the very bottom, we would total up our itemized deductions. And again, you would only use this Schedule A for federal purposes if it's larger than your standard deduction. But again, because the Hawaii standard deduction is so small, you still may want to fill out the Schedule A to help you calculate the Hawaii itemized deductions. Let's take a look at um, standard deductions. So, so here I have summarized, and it's linked in our um, Laulima site in the chapter resources folder the, for the first folder, uh, federal uh, and Hawaii st common standard deductions. Again, if you can be claimed as a dependent, you may need to go through a calculation to calculate the exact amount for your standard deduction. And I have it uh, tabbed off by different years, yeah? So again, this is available, of course, in the instructions to all the tax forms, but also summarized at our Laulima site or linked in our Laulima site. So here's a sample of the uh, tax tables. And you use, again, the tax tables if your taxable income is under 100000 It's built for only taxpayers with uh, less than that amount. So you would go across the taxable income row, and then you stop under the filing status column, Yeah, your filing status. Note that, let's kind of zoom in here. If let's say that your taxable income is uh, 69,750, you notice it also appears here. What you got to do is use this second row, yeah? not this first one up here. And then again, you stop under the filing status column to get your total tax liability for the year. 
Let's take a look at the tax rate schedule. Again, all of these are in your textbook, I believe in Appendix A or in the instructions to the 1040 form. So you would first find the, of course, again, your taxable income has to be 100000 or more, and you find the correct tax rate schedule. So we have it based upon the filing status. So here's an example for Carol who has a single filing status and her taxable income is more than 100000 So the formula is to take that taxable income and you look it up here in this uh, rate schedule and it falls within this range right here. Over 82500 but less than $150,000, uh, 57500 so what we got to do is subtract out this beginning amount, which is repeated over here, yeah, from the taxable income. And then the excess of our taxable income over that beginning of what we call these brackets, the beginning of this uh, fourth bracket, the excess is taxed at this rate. Sometimes we call this the marginal tax rate. So just the excess is taxed at that marginal rate. But then the first $9,525 is taxed at 10%. And then the second range is taxed at 12%. And the third range is taxed at 22%. So instead of doing all this multiplication and adding, all of these amounts are built into this amount right here in this same line we're working with, $14,089.50, which is the tax on the first three brackets. And here's the tax on her marginal rate, marginal bracket. And we add all of it up to get the total tax liability for the year. Okay, so that's how, again, you use the tax rate schedule. Let's uh, talk about uh, another tax rate for qualified dividends. Again, a topic that you had learned last semester. Um, and then also capital gains. Really net capital gains or net long-term capital gains that get taxed at lower tax rates than we have built into the tax table or the tax rate schedule. Here are those lower rates, 0, 15, or 20 percent. And based upon the taxpayer's filing status, you would look up their taxable income that includes that qualified dividend and capital gain income either from zero through uh, 38600 for a single person, what you would do is you would back out that qualified dividend and net long-term capital gain and tax it at zero. And then the rest of the taxable income, you would use the tax table to figure out the tax liability for the whole year. But the most common rate is for people to fall within 38600 and you notice here how high this amount is. So most people don't reach this. So if their taxable income falls within these two numbers here, you would back out the taxable income, uh, back out the taxable gain and qualified dividends and tax those amounts at 15%, which is going to be lower than the marginal rate they fall in. And then the rest of their taxable income, you would use a tax table or tax rate schedule. Again, that's based upon... Uh, these um, um, bracket amounts here are based upon the filing status. And you can see it's adjusted for inflation for next year. Okay, so again, if you have this type of income, qualified dividend and net long-term capital gain, there's an additional calculation you got to go through to uh, figure out the tax. And it's not really on a tax form that you do this calculation but it's done on a worksheet that comes from the instruction booklet for the 1040 form. And usually worksheets are not filed with the government. You just keep it for your own records. So if you go through this detail, you'll find out you have to do something called a Schedule D and Forms 8949. But eventually all the nitty-gritty calculations are done here. So if you remember that 015 and 20% uh, rates. Well, here's those bracket amounts again, yeah, that we saw in the previous slide. And here's the zero rate. And here's the 15% rate. And here's the 20% rate. 
and they tell you to, oh, go use the tax table or the rate schedule to figure out the tax on the other income to get the total income tax liability. Now, there's other taxes besides income taxes, especially if you have this uh, qualified dividend and uh, long-term capital gain. Yeah, There's something called net investment income tax that for wealthier, higher income taxpayers, they have to pay another 3.8% on their uh, investment income. Okay, that we're, we won't go into here. And then another topic that you learned last semester in Accounting 134 are tax credits. Remember, credits are better dollar for dollar than deductions. Credits you had learned in last semester's Chapter 7. Now, again, you got to go back to all of these previous chapters that you covered last semester when you do um, tax returns this semester. Okay, we're continuing to apply all of that knowledge you learned last semester. So here's some example of credits. So if you have children, I believe under 13 or 14, under 13, and you have to have uh, uh, care for them so you can go to work, we have the child and dependent care credit. Even elderly, maybe parents or a spouse that can't take care of themselves, that you have to have pay uh, care so you can go to work or even go to school you may get a credit for that type of expenses. Maybe this applies to you, the education credit. Okay, And uh, we may see this again later on this semester. And then the government motivates taxpayers to save for their retirement by giving them a credit here. Another credit is for people who have work income. They call it earned income. Yeah, job income, business income. And Generally, if you have children, this type of credit for moderate low-income taxpayers can end up in the thousands of dollars. So again, I think you covered this last semester. So one of the homework uh, problems for the first week is to calculate out an earned income credit and a dependent care credit. Refer to Chapter 7 yeah, when you guys work on those problems. Let's take a look at uh, the Hawaii tax form. I will have you prepare a Hawaii tax return later this semester. In the case of individuals like you and me, we probably fill out this form N11 since we're residents of Hawaii for the whole year. But if you're a part-year resident or uh, a non-resident Hawaii, but you have Hawaii source income, then you probably will be filling out a Form N-15. So just like the federal, the first page has a lot of contact information, the same five filing statuses, um, dependent information, the first dollar amount is on the next page, page two of the four page N11 form. The first dollar amount is rewriting in the federal adjusted gross income. So in other words, you probably got to have pretty much your federal return done before you can start on your Hawaii tax return. Then what we're going to do to this federal adjusted gross income is to add amounts that are not subject to federal tax but are subject to Hawaii tax laws. Some of them are kind of common, yeah? If you know a federal civil service worker, they may have COLA. Or if you have a, a state or county employee, they may have a employee retirement system withholdings. And then we may subtract out income that is not subject to Hawaii tax it's already in here on the federal but not subject to Hawaii so we're going to subtract it out stuff like uh, maybe pension income that's employer funded or social security income and the end result is to get a Hawaii AGI now from there we're going to subtract out either the Hawaii itemized deductions so again, maybe you didn't itemize on the federal return, but it probably is very possible you're going to do that on Hawaii. So the same categories of itemized we saw on that Schedule A, now subtotaled here on the N11 form. When we compare that with the Hawaii standard deduction, and look at how small these amounts are. 
So most times people can easily itemize on Hawaii, but still going to be claiming the standard under federal. So that's subtracted out the larger of the two. And another subtract subtraction on the next page is Hawaii exemptions. Exemptions kind of disappeared from the federal return from 2018, but are still here on Hawaii. So for each exemption you claim, that each person you claim, you may subtract out 1144, maybe additional amounts for age 65 or older for taxpayers, or some optional amount if the taxpayer is disabled. And then you arrive at the Hawaii taxable income that you look up either on the tax table or tax rate schedule. There is a smaller amount for net long-term capital gains, but not as beneficial like we saw on the federal. And there are lots of credits for Hawaii. Most of them are the so-called refundable. There is even a relatively new Hawaii earned income credit which is a percentage of the federal credit. But that credit, at least for Hawaii, is so-called non-refundable. So it kind of goes through this Schedule CR. So just like federal, you eventually will either have an overpayment that's going to be refunded or credited to the next year, or a tax due. Where's my tax due? Amount owing here that you have to file with the um, federal return. Just like federal, you can have your refund direct deposited. Just like federal, you can also have a, a Hawaii Department of Taxation account um, debiting out of your bank if you owe. Again, again most people file electronically, but if you um, do paper returns, you got to have the taxpayer sign the return, date it, and mail it in to the proper office that's listed in the instructions to the N11 form. And again, we have a section for paid preparers. We're assuming this is not going to be filled in during our semester. Okay, but again, professionals, professionals need to fill that section out. I think that's it. Kind of long um, uh review of last semester yeah but again you gotta refer to those chapters from last semester to continue working on tax returns here in our accounting 137 class all right email me if you have any questions